like to call this meeting to order. And um, I would ask that everybody stay muted if you can um, during the meeting. And, and if you need to talk, just like raise your hand or something that way, then if there's any extraneous noise, we maybe won't have um, issues. Um, so we don't have any public, do we? I think not. Um, so um, I guess the first thing is to look at the minutes from the last meeting. And if we could do that, if anyone has um, any comments or corrections, um, wave your hand. And if not, uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? A motion to approve. Chris, and do I have a second? Bryden, a second. Great, thank you, Bryden. Um, so all in favor, please wave your hand. Uh, those of you opposed, please wave your hand if you're opposed. Okay, so it looks like the minutes um, for August are unanimously approved. And we'll move right on uh, to accessions. Eric, if you would give us the lowdown. All right. So I do have a PowerPoint. So uh, hopefully that made it to staff. Great. Nice. Um, so it's actually a pretty light month this month, uh, partly because I just didn't get everything ready because this meeting came up quick um, but also last month we were catching up uh, from a lot of months of being off so uh, if we could go to the next slide i'll talk about the first item on the accession list let's see Still on the first slide. Is it possible to get the next one? Yep. Hey guys, we're trying to get to the next slide. Give us one sec, okay? Sorry about that. Ah, uh, the joys of technology. There we go. Uh, there we go. Great. Um, so this is the Dorothy Schlegel collection. Um, Dorothy uh, is now in her 90s, uh, lived in Longmont basically her entire life. And as she is moving into a, um, a different facility, doing some downsizing and uh, uh, her family gave us a number of items that uh, she had collected over the years, um, photographs of her family, uh, a photo album of the members of, of her high school class from 1948, um, and um, some things related to her church, Christ Congregational Church, um, which was at um, Francis and uh, Mountain View and has closed fairly recently, um, and then a few other things related to the family. And, and the Schlegels are, are a pretty large um, interconnected family within uh, the Longmont area, and they are uh, Russian-German, so um, ethnically German, uh, but uh, many of, of the Russian-Germans um, had moved to the Volga River Valley in Russia in the 1700s, retained their German identity, and then around the turn of the 20th century, as uh, the Russian uh, Empire was really changing a lot, a lot of them came to the United States, and um, a number of them settled in this area. So this adds to our documentation of both uh, sort of the middle of the 20th century Longmont and also a, a prominent Russian-German family. Uh, any questions on the, the Dorothy Schlegel? collection? If not, we'll move to the next slide. Hopefully. All right, so this is um, 
a single page of a newspaper from South Bend, Indiana. Normally we would not take a newspaper from outside Colorado, but in this case, this one is actually what I'm guessing was a nationally syndicated story titled The Battle of the Breadbasket. It has these seven photos of Longmont residents who were helping out with the harvest during World War II. Uh, so it's a very interesting uh, element. I'm, I'm kind of surprised I haven't run into it before, but um, early years of World War II, there was a huge labor shortage, and um, this was basically people from the town going out and, and helping out on, on a local farm. So a very interesting uh, example of kind of a home front effort and this actually came from the Broomfield uh, Veterans Museum. Um, a former staff member of ours uh, works there and was going through some of their materials and, and felt it really was more appropriate here. So uh, that is why we, we have that. And um, you can see it's a little bit folded out. We'd, we probably would do a, um, uh, what we call a, humidification and flattening, so it, it got nice and flat before we finally put it away. Um, but any other uh, questions on uh, this World War II era newspaper? All right, so these are the only two um, accessions we're actually ready to have a vote on. So if uh, someone would, would like to move on that or uh, have further discussion, uh, and then we can talk a little bit about some coming accessions after that. So do I hear a motion to approve these two accessions? I would, Dale, I would move. We approve the accession of the Schlegel uh, collection and the newspaper detailing the breadbasket from World War II. Great, thank you, Dale. Is there a second? Second, this is Rhea, I second that. Great. Thank you, Rhea. Um, all in favor, wave your hand. I don't know, I can't see everyone, um, but um, all opposed. If anyone is opposed, unmute yourself and make yourself known because I can't only see four people. <laughs> okay, I'm going to assume um, based on this that um, the, uh, the two accessions um, have been um, unanimously approved. So Joanne, if you... That, that's great. And then um, what else is coming up, Eric? And then if we can uh, go back to the PowerPoint for the last slide. Um, so if we can go to the next slide now and um, I'll talk about some things that um, still in process, but hoping to have ready um, some of them for next time, some of them probably for, for ones beyond that. But um, the Peggy Carroll archival collection is one I'm, I'm kind of excited about. Um, the uh, Carroll family uh, owned a pharmacy in Longmont and someone in the family clearly had a very good eye for photography. There's some really excellent photographs in that collection. So I should be able to bring that next month. Um, the donors of that collection are actually coming up tomorrow to uh, drop off a, a few more things. Um, so I wanted to hopefully get everything together before I presented that to uh, the board. Um, then I wanted to give you all an update on uh, effort that we started back in April um, that is still ongoing. Um, so when the COVID crisis hit, really museums all across the country realized this is something that we need to be documenting. And so uh, we've put out a call to the public for anyone who wishes to contribute uh, primarily at this point digital photographs because um, at the point when we first put out the call we were still closed to the public and even now although we're open um, there's definitely I think uh, some challenges as far as collecting uh, items related to COVID um, as far as making sure that they are safe for um, for collecting. There's been some, some recent discoveries that things, um, that the virus stays on objects longer than we thought it did. So, so at this point, we're still just collecting digital photos, but we've actually had 10 different people offer us material. Um, not necessarily everything is um, 
going to really make sense. We've had people, you know, send us photos of their dogs, which is, well, that's nice, but I'm not sure how it connects to COVID. <laughs> um, so, um, so, you know, that's something I'm still kind of going through to figure out what really is um, connected to the events we're having now and, and certainly still, still open for additional uh, donations. And then um, I've been doing quite a bit of, of documentation and some collecting as well. So um, that's, uh, that's a little bit larger collection, but uh, so it may not be ready for next month, but hopefully the ones, the small ones, we've gotten handfuls of photographs, those will be ready. And then the, the last thing, and this, this may be a little further down the road, but uh, those of you that have been on the board for, for a while, remember that uh, we acquired the collections of uh, Longmont Channel 8 when it closed down uh, at uh, the end of 2019. Um, there was also the Channel 8 public access program, uh, which also closed down at that point. Those uh, videos were actually owned by the individuals that created them. And so uh, while we have the physical uh, videos and, and for the older ones, DVDs, in our possession, we need to actually individually approach each owner and see if they're interested in uh, bringing them in. And so we started to do that and then COVID hit and so we really haven't gotten back to that. But there's, a, there's about 20 individuals total that contributed videos. Not all of them necessarily have a local tie. Um, and I guess that's something I'd, I'd be interested in kind of hearing from the board if say, um, a local person made a video about, say, skiing in Aspen. Is that something you think we should have because it was made by a local person? Or is it something we shouldn't collect because it really is about skiing in Aspen? Um, so I don't know if anyone has any, any thoughts on that. Um, I don't know. It doesn't sound as much like something that we might want. I don't, from my point of view, um, it's a Colorado thing, I guess, depending on who the person is who produced it. I mean, if they have some particular relevance or um, if there's some, you know, some noted reason why we'd want whatever it is they had to say. I, I don't know. What do you got? What does everybody else think? And we can probably take away the slide. I don't think we need to do that anymore so we can see everybody. I would say that I agree with Eve. It would really only be relevant if the subject matter is relevant to Longmont or the person is someone of note in, in Longmont or historically or something like that. It seems like some random person making a video doesn't necessarily have much to do with the Longmont Museum if it's not about Longmont. I, I just had a thought and I haven't had a chance to think through this, but is there any value in trying to preserve the entire Channel 8 archives? I mean, I haven't really thought through this, but if this is something that was done for Longmont through the Cable Trust or whatever it was at that time, at one time it was Channel 3 and then it was Channel 8, I mean, is there some value in preserving everything that was produced by that? I have no, I have no idea. That's a question. Um. So one clarification, so this, these are videos that were produced by individuals, um, not by the cable trust itself, but then basically um, given a copy to um, Channel 8 to air um, as part of their public access program. Um, okay, thanks for that clarification, Eric, because I wasn't sure if it was part of the whole thing or, so thank you. Anybody else have 
comments or questions about how we might feel about them. Go ahead. You need to unmute yourself, Tom. So I'm, a, I'm not real clear then through the Channel 8, um, th those archives. There was a volunteer group that was part of that and these it, private individuals did a number of uh, filming of different events around Longmont. Is that what you're talking about? So, yeah, there was a, a group of volunteers. They were um, basically all through the Channel 8 public access program where essentially anyone uh, could produce a video and, and uh, then offer it to Channel 8 for airing. And some of those videos were filmed here in Longmont and some of them were done by people who had a particular interest. Um, say they, they were interested in, I think there's one on a particular type of doll and they, they did a lot of research and, and filmed the video on, uh, I don't remember, maybe the um, Russian nesting dolls, we'll say, I'm not sure that's yeah. what it actually is. But um, so, you know, their, their video n doesn't necessarily relate directly to Longmont history, but it was produced by someone here locally. And, but, so there are, but there are some videos that do pertain to Longmont directly. Yes, yes. and those, those I feel like are a little more straightforward to look at and say it, it certainly makes sense to bring those to the board. But some of these others are a little more like, well, you know, um, I uh, uh, just wanted your, you all's thoughts on whether, as Dale mentioned, whether we wanted to keep the entire corpus of everything or, um, you know, document the video, uh, video making in Longmont, um, even if the, the particular subject matter is not a Longmont specific subject. So if the, if the doll video has to do with some of the dolls that we have already in the collection, <laughs> does it make sense to keep it for that reason? If um, yeah, that's, that's a good point. I, I will check on that one and see if it's a type of, it's not any of the actual dolls owned by the museum but I, I would certainly check and see if it does relate to um, dolls that are in our collection. So is there a deadline to say whether yes or no on the acceptance of all the videos or is, are they just kind of in storage somewhere waiting to be? Um, well, what we will need to do as staff is if we feel like, yes, we want to proceed with a donation, then we would contact each of the producers and see if they are willing to donate them. Um, the, the way the, the public access worked is public access just got the right to show them on channel eight. So okay. essentially there's no, uh, we don't really have any, any rights to them beyond um, viewing them um, for for potential use in the collection. So we'd want a little more rights before we'd be able to accept them. So, um, and if there's somewhere we just feel like there's, there's not any Longmont tie, um, then we probably just wouldn't contact those folks at all. So sure. just um, uh, trying to make sure we don't, so uh, you don't, have a, don't end up needing them. So you have an actual inventory of titles of these videos? And we do. There are, uh, I believe, over 200 videos um, oh. in the inventory. Um, everything from, you know, very short 30 second clips um, all the way up to, you know, multi hour long uh, programs. Sure. So now you have something to watch when you're eating lunch. <laughs> That's right. <great. laughs> yeah, yeah. And of course, the, the Channel 8 collection itself, the, the videos actually produced by Channel 8, is um, 
about 30 more boxes of videotapes, DVDs, et cetera. So, so we've also got that collection as a, as a separate item. Um, mm. And we actually did just recently get a grant to start digitizing that collection. So uh, we'll start to be able to see what some of these old videos have on them. Should be really interesting, or I hope so. Just you won't know until you try. Great. Um, any other upcoming things, Eric? Um, those are those are kind of the main ones. Um, so the the uh, Peggy Carroll collection you should see next month, and probably a good bit of the COVID first round of the COVID collection, and um, maybe some of the real you know straightforward. Uh, parts of the Channel 8 collection if we uh, manage to get word back from uh, from the owners of that on time. Um, so so it may be a longer list next month or um, uh, it, it may it may not just depending on how much we manage to get put together in the next month. So. Great thank you. Um, Kim would you like to tell us the state of the museum? Well, I sure I would. Um, you guys, I think, got the director's report in the packet that Joanne sent out. Um, and it occurs to me that there's a lot of, of information here that also appeared in last month's report. But um, I want to kind of go over it um, because there's some more details, I think, that we can go through. Um, the, in that administrative part, um, we talk again about the SCFD Tier 2 qualification um, and right now what they are projecting is that we're going to get $125,000 as a result of the the, um, the bump from tier 3 to tier 2 in SCFD um, and that's the scientific cultural facilities district for those who might not know about it um, that's a taxing district that we are a part of um, and we've been receiving about $20,000 a year through that um, revenue source, but with this bump um, into a different tier, we're going to be receiving more than $100,000 more. So that's the projection. Um, but I filled in a little bit more of the blanks here that that figure is actually based on the SCFD board reducing their tax revenue projections by 30% as a result of the coronavirus. And what they're actually seeing is more like 9% reduction. And so what I think that means for us is that we're going to end up seeing more than $125,000 in our distribution from SCFD. Don't know how much, but I think that what we can bank on is that we're going to receive at the very least $125,138.69. But chances are we're going to see a lot more than that, I think. Um, and then another thing that happened since we last talked about this is that there was actually um, a board meeting that I gave a presentation at and um, as well as a bunch of other tier two organizations. And at that board meeting, they actually passed a resolution, which was um, quite, quite a big deal. Um, because of the coronavirus, they were really trying to understand how they might be able to maintain all of the different tiers within um, the, the organization, tier one, tier two, tier three. And, um, and so what they ended up doing is the board passed a resolution earlier, uh, uh, sorry, it's at, at the end of August, um, they passed a resolution that would maintain basically exactly what we submitted this year. And so all of our revenue project, all of our revenues um, that we reported for this um, past fiscal year will remain and the threshold for revenue will remain the same. And so what that means for us is that we are safely in tier two for the next cycle. Um, so that is a really fantastic um, evolution that ended up happening. Um, part of the rationale for doing that is that if all of the tier two organizations fell into tier three, that it would really devastate tier three. And so they, they tried really, really hard to figure out a good solution for being able to maintain tier two and therefore maintain tier three. So that is really good news for us. Um, that had been kind of the rumor for some time, but at that last board meeting, they passed that resolution. So now that is official word that we will be, um, we'll, we'll maintain our tier two status for at least another year. 
um, as you know, the way that we maintain that tier two status is that we meet a, a qualifying revenue threshold every year um, that we're part of it. And so we will see what that means for years and to the future because what we're expecting and what a lot of people are, are expecting is that we're gonna continue to see some um, economic impact as a result of coronavirus. And so, um, and it may, it may impact what we need to um, submit for the 2022 cycle. That would be based on our 2021 fiscal year. Um, and so, you know, the, the jury is out as to what we are gonna end up seeing for a 2021 fiscal year. Um, but of course, we will do everything we can to m meet whatever threshold or, you know, be able to, whatever it is that they come up with, they may come up with other kind of way that we would be able to um, say in the tier two. And, and I do think that they are being extremely responsive and resourceful and creative in terms of trying to, to figure all of this stuff out. Um, because the way that they actually calculate the distribution is that they um, take our qualifying revenue and they take our um, uh, attendance. And there's a fancy calculation that they do in order to come up with the, um, the actual uh, amount of money that we receive from them. And so as we have been doing and everybody else has been doing, we've been, um, our only attendance or most of our attendance, we've been getting some people through the door, but um, most of our attendance is a virtual attendance. And so um, the way that they have done it in the past is that it's, they actually count paid attendance. And so we're not able to count very many paid people right now. Um, and so they are, are um, develop, developing a task force that is going to look at um, how to count this virtual attendance um, that's going to uh, start this fall. And so we'll hear more um, by the end of the year about how they're going to try to figure out how to count this um, virtual attendance. That's a really good thing. Um, I think that, that we actually... Um, even in terms of our revenue, our attendance, our paid attendance, our, uh, the programs that we have been able to um, uh, transfer to a digital platform, I will say the Longmont Museum has done extremely well. I am on all kinds of different um, uh, groups and, and um, meetings for uh, municipal, municipal museums, and we have we have survived this in a way that a lot of other people have not. So I think that um, the staff is really to be commended for all of their terribly, terribly hard work um, for being able to do this. Um, but I think that we are gonna come out really, really well in, in comparison to our, our um, sort of colleagues in the field. So that's good news. It's not good news for them, it's good news for us. Um, and then uh, continuing on into the report, I think that we've already talked about the fact that we received an NEH CARES Act um, grant, and that was to the tune of about $118,000. And um, we've finally been able to um, hire one of the people that we had submitted for that grant um, uh, in the proposal of that grant. And so we have a new digital um, communication specialist that should be starting on Monday. His name is Scott Yoho. And so he'll be a full-time position that'll, that is gonna help us with a lot of this digital um, programming. Um, and then we're, I think we're gonna be hiring another person, a half-time person um, in addition to that. Um, as you know, this was a joint application with the library. And so we're gonna be buying, I think Joanne just bought, in fact, um, the hotspots that are part of that grant proposal as well. So those will be um, basically a little device that you can check out from the library um, that then gives you access to the internet. And so that really is an accessibility issue through uh, for, for folks that aren't able to have internet in their homes. So that's moving forward really nicely. So um, we're feeling good about the, the proposal, the project for the grant. And then we should be hearing soon hopefully very soon, about another grant proposal um, through the IMLS, which basically would take this project and, and extend it to another 18 months. And so hopefully we'll be able to um, even, even do more of this online programming because the reality is this isn't going away anytime soon. And I think that um, every time we get together to talk about, okay, so what are we gonna do next season for programs? What are we gonna do next season for programs? 
every time we come to the conclusion that we need to continue to do the online programming. It's just not, not safe yet uh, to think about having big groups of people. Um, and so I think that, that it's good to be able to lean on this grant funding for, for being able to make this transition. We've also got an appeal letter that um, should be hitting mailbox very soon um, that um, hopefully we'll be able to, to rely on some of our um, generous donors to be able to help um, us adjust to the, we, we saw some pretty significant um, hits to our revenue as a result of all of this. So even though we're, we're doing well by comparison, our revenues did take a pretty big hit. So we're hoping that this um, uh, campaign will help um, fill that gap. And then in our education department, we also hired an AmeriCorps volunteer. Her name is Courtney Pletcher. And this was uh, a position that was actually funded by our friends of the Longmont Museum. And so she started on August the 31st and it's really intended, this position really is intended to um, broaden our reach in terms of our education programs and in terms of some of our community engagement. And she's been doing fantastic job in the very short time that she's been with us. So we're super, super excited to have her on board. The fall programming started um, September the 7th, and so we've got Discovery Days, Art and Sip, um, and a lot of the, the programs through the auditorium. What I'll say is that Discovery Days have been a big hit. Basically what we, we've been able to translate this online program is that we've got these um, kits that um, parents can buy for their kids, and so you buy the kit, you got all the supplies that you need, you pick up at, at the museum, and then you take that home and you have a facilitated um, uh, craft through um, the internet with, with Miss Lee. Those have been a really big hit and we've been um, struggling actually to get those kits together in order to be able to provide that for our visitors. We have struggled more with the art and sip that has not been nearly as big of a hit as the Discovery Days have been. And so um, the first one we ended up um, having um, that available for free. Once it was free, people got really interested in it. <laughs> so those kids just flew out the door. Um, and so we're trying to um, work a little bit with the cost of that program because I do think that what we saw with that is that people are interested in it they just don't want to pay so much money for it. So we're kind of working um, through that because it's difficult to provide everything for free, um, especially under these conditions. Um, but, but I think that we see that there is a demand. We just have to hit the right spot in terms of the cost that we're going to um, charge for it, the fee that we're going to charge for it. Uh, let's see. We've got... Um, uh, the next slide item was the digital communication specialist. Then we also have um, the, this, the Day of the Dead um, is also approaching really quickly. And I think we talked about a lot about that the last time that we were together, that um, that's another program that we have shifted to an online platform. And I think it's going to be really quite exciting. Um, there's going to be weekly content that's added to the website. Um, that we've, There's a, a website um, that is specific to Day of the Dead. Um, and there's going to be weekly content that's added to that. And so I think it's going to end up being a really, really wonderful repository of cultural heritage kind of um, programs. Um, and with that, we have um, also got the kits that we're putting together for um, kind of an at-home celebration. And so if anybody is interested in helping us put together those kits, um, there are some volunteer opportunities available because we've got a lot of a lot of kits being assembled at the moment, um, and it, and what we're finding is that it's taking up a lot of um, time to do that. So um, I think that we may end up having a soccer team help us out, and then there may be another um, uh, kids group that would help us out. And so Anne Maca is coordinating um, those volunteer efforts. And so if any of you are interested in that, then. Um, please, I can I can get Anne's information for you and, and get that going. Um, let's see. Eric already told you. Was there a question? You guys interrupt me at any point if you have questions. Um, Eric already already told you about the grant that we got um, for him to be able to digitize the Channel Eight collection. So that is really good news. And I should say too that um, you know. Part of what we were able to do when we had to start working from home and, and you know, sort of reevaluate what 
what where our where we were spending our time eric spent a lot of his time doing grant writing and ultimately that i think is going to end up helping us a lot with that cfb as well because even though we weren't seeing admission through the door we were receiving um, revenue through those grants. And so I, I, I feel like that's part of the reason that we are gonna end up looking really, really good in the future when it comes to SCFB distribution. So thanks, Eric, a lot for being able to pivot. Pivot is the name of the game these days, right? <laughs> So he had a grant to be able to help with that digitizing, which is also good because, you know, it, it's two birds with one stone. We get the money, we're able to record the revenue, and we're able to get some of that activity taken care of. So that's really great. Um, and then let's see, we've got the, um, we've got the historic, historic walking tours. Um, so this is one of the things that we actually are doing in person at the, at the moment. There's not a lot that we're doing in person these days, but Eric has been doing some um, uh, virtual downtown um, walking tours. And then as you guys know, we also have the, um, the digital version of the walking tour so that um, we were able to launch and we've had that in English and in Spanish. And so um, if you're interested in checking it out, you can actually jump on and go downtown um, and it's tour Longmont dot on um, and you can access the what what Eric has been doing for a long time basically we translated um, that to a digital format um, and of course I don't think we'll see any decrease in the demand for Eric because he is our rock star when it comes to that so that's kind of fun um, and then of course I think that you all know that Elizabeth Bodwin um, has uh, left us to go on to the Broomfield um, Depot Museum so um, she was able to get a full-time position working for them, so she's no longer with us. Um, and she, but before she left, she was able to um, start us on another addition to those walking tours, um, the Innovative Women of Longmont. And so um, we're trying to fill in the gaps um, to get that tour um, moving forward after um, Elizabeth's departure. And then we're gonna add yet another one, at least one more, um, that will look at the Latinx history of Longmont. And then in terms of exhibitions, um, Terry Maker's exhibit has just been deinstalled and we're working on the installation of the um, Dia de los Muertos um, exhibition. So we've already talked about that we'll basically that exhibit is gonna feature, half, half of the gallery will have the um, altars that um, you've seen in annually and then we're also going to have half of the gallery dedicated to Tony um, Ortega and so that is um, basically uh, drawings from books that he has produced with a collaborator and so we have the original artwork for that um, and then he's going to do an altar as well and then we also have a collaboration with the um, Art and Public Places program to do a downtown mural that he is um, he's created for us, and that's going to be a community uh, uh, contrib community contribution. So again, if you're interested in some um, uh, additional work, um, we've got some opportunities for being able to um, paint that mural and and help with the creation of the mural. Um, and so let me know if you're interested in that. We can get you signed up. We've got some slots available. Hi, Susie. Um, so that we're really excited about as well. I, I think that that ended up being one of those um, coronavirus silver linings that probably that never would have happened had it not been for us having to come up with some alternative plans because of the coronavirus. And so I think that it, it'll be a great kind of enduring um, celebration of the um, Longmont Museum's 20th, and, uh, 20th year of celebrating um, uh, Dia de los Muertos, and so we're super excited about that, and it's going to be a very cool um, mural, so we're cool. We're excited about that. Um, the uh, exhibits department um, has also done some kind of um, creative work in terms of filling in for coronavirus um, needs, and so they made um, these plexiglass barriers, and at this point, they've got well over 70 of them that they have designed and, and uh, manufactured for um, different kind of customer service desks throughout the city. 
And so we continue to get requests for those as buildings are opening up and um, we have other needs for those. And so the museum has been a really good resource for being able to, to fill that need. Um, we've got, let's see, um, a couple of interns that are working in the exhibition department. We also have a couple of interns, uh, one's working for um, art and public places and one is working for the um, auditorium programs. You may have seen that CU has actually issued a stay at home order for students. And so what we're having to do more pivoting and I think we're gonna actually ask those students to stay home and see if they can do some work from home. But at this point, it, it doesn't seem safe to, um, to have them at the museum at the moment. And so we're gonna, we're gonna do the best that we can to keep them occupied with something meaningful but I think probably um, for the foreseeable future, for at least another couple of weeks, we'll, we'll ask them to, to work from home so that we're not exposing everyone else at the museum to what might be happening on, on campus at CU. Um, we do, I think everybody knows that we um, shelved the TP to Tiny House exhibition that we had planned on opening this summer. And so we had to shuffle things around um, in terms of trailers and, and storage. And so that was a huge amount of work for staff. And so that was taken care of. We've also got some photos um, that we've shifted around in the Kaiser C space. And so the exhibition department has been working on that. Um, and then we're busy also working on um, kind of finalizing some of the plans for um, the Impressionism exhibit that's going to be um, rolling out in early next year. So we've got a new title for that, which is Enduring Impressions. And so that exhibit is coming together really, really nicely. We've got auditorium programs um, that are really, I think, quite robust. We're very excited about some of the, the new things that we are launching. We've got, um, you guys may have per even participated in the FACE concert. Um, which was a, a, a collaboration with the LDDA. Um, and I think that they are very thrilled with that partnership. Um, and they're very thrilled with having the ability to rely on, on the expertise that we basically developed over the summer concert series. And so I think that ended up being a really great uh, collaboration. Um, we do have two rentals. One was yesterday or today, I can't remember, very recently. Um, we had um, Dolan and Associates, and then we've got um, a law firm that did uh, that is going to do um, a retreat. And so it's slow, but I think we are getting some rental activity, very small, very safe. Um, everybody's masked. Everybody is um, maintaining social distance. And so certainly we're not opening these up to big events at this, at this point, but um, we are starting to see a little bit of activity in terms of um, the frequent filer, filer, liars, excuse me, event on September the 10th was quite a good um, uh, turnout. I think we ended up with 100 people and 90 of those were paid. And so that was actually a really good turnout for that event. And um, I think, again, another success in terms of the way that we, um, we are able to accommodate people under these conditions. What we did is basically had people um, in small groups kind of rotate through the galleries and the atrium and the uh, courtyard. Um, and then we had um, a second round of those people come through. So small people in, in various spaces at any given time. Um, so being creative in ways that we can pull these things off. And then we've got some, um, on the 17th tomorrow, we've got another um, uh, event happening that'll be live streamed. That's the Voices of Change, the History of Race and Social Justice in um, Longmont. And that's a collaboration with LMAC. Um, and I think that, that that's another um, kind of creative um, uh, change, <clears throat> excuse me, change that we've been able to do that we've got these social justice events that are on the horizon. Um, and then Cleo Parker Robinson um, event uh, on September the 24th. So we've got some really, really exciting things that I think are on the horizon. In visitor services, we've hired a new front desk person. We um, had uh, uh, someone um, 
took a took a position and so left during the coronavirus and so we were able to refill that position which was really good and so they they've just recently started um Caden Stice um and then we've also got I think you all know this but um we're still operating under our reduced um hours which is nine to three Tuesday through Saturday and that really is in order for us to be able to make sure that we are accommodating the cleaning schedule that we need to maintain. And um, so that is largely based on our janitors, um, janitorial staff's ability to be able to do that cleaning. And so um, uh, that may change as things um, in terms of uh, um, being able to rely on um, contract staff. Um, so we're kind of, we're, we've got it on the docket to talk about it at our next staff meeting about if, how long we're gonna have to maintain those reduced hours. But really that's, that's based largely on us being able to maintain a cleaning schedule that is um, per our opening uh, documentation that we would have approved by the county. Um, let's see. We've been sending out a lot of postcards, and so the front desk staff has been um, very, very busy, busy helping us label um, those postcards to send out. So you may have seen some of those yesterday's and the Thursday nights at the museum. Um, and then we do hope, even though you know, again, we're we're pretty um, uh, limited in terms of the number of people that um, we've been seeing through the door. The day that that actually does um, offer a lot in the gift shop. And it, it tends to be a really big revenue source for us in the gift shop. Um, and so we are hopeful that we'll still be able to see some, um, some activity in the gift shop through some of those sales. So we, we, we've got some things ready to go for that. And then um, Art and Public Places, we've got the 2020 Shop Art Program that's well underway. And we've already got one that's completed and approved. Um, and there's several other, the others that are on the docket for that. Um, Angela and Eileen um, have attended the Prime Gov training, which is part of the um, shift that's happening um, with city council and the city um, manager's office. And so this is going to be able to help, um, I think, with uh, some of these meetings. So we will, we may see some of that um, impact through um, the advisory board as well, um, which is basically just a management system for some of those um, uh, agendas and things like that. And then also the final one on the list is that AAP submitted their annual report that was presented to the city council a couple of weeks ago now. And so that's something that is required um, per, per the, the um, ordinance for art and public places. And so they that was um, presented um, to city, city council basically um, detailing all of their accomplishments from the previous year. And so that was a good accomplishment for them. Any questions? I feel like I'm babbling. No, my only, um, I just had a comment. Yeah. Um, I, I too think that the museum staff has done an incredible job of turning, you know, what was in-person um, activities into digital or, you know, virtual, uh, virtually supported things. I mean, it's, I've been very impressed um, with all the different things that have been offered. And um, so I think we can all be proud of that. The very smart, talented people that are staff at the museum. So. I was in um, the Longmont Multicultural Action Committee meeting on Monday. And someone said to me that they felt like the Longmont Museum was being a leader in the field, that we have been so responsive and so creative that we really have become a leader in the field. And I, I think that's absolutely true. And it's because the staff is, has been very, very hardworking. <laughs> cool. Um... I don't have any reports um, as the chair. And I don't think we have any old business. If anybody thinks of something that we didn't didn't cover, uh, let me know. Is there any new business? Okay. Um, any comments? Okay. <laughs> Everybody's tired of me. All right. Um, if there aren't any other comments, then. Um, I will um, 
I think that it's time to adjourn the meeting. Do we have, um, would anyone like to move that we adjourn? Sure. Thank you, Tom. Second. Nope, Bryden, I'll, I'll second. second. Thank you, Bryden. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um, we have unanimously agreed to adjourn the meeting as of, I think it's 520. Thank you all. Good to see all of you. Thank you. Good to see you as well. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Care, you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, staff, again. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good one. Thank you.